Good afternoon. Please note that this session is being recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, you are asked to drop off this call at this time. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Adriana Marzette and I am with the National Indian Health Board and I serve as a public health program coordinator. I will be moderating this webinar session of the Emerging and Re-Emerging Infectious Disease Peer Learning Webinar Series. I'm happy to have Dr. Wei and Dr. Lozado with us today. In this session, we will discuss how they were able to collaborate with multiple partners in their area to convert four Gallup hotels into temporary shelters to quarantine during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, before we start, I do want to go over a few housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded. If you do not consent to being recorded, you are asked to drop off of this call. The presenter's PowerPoint slide and the recorder will be made available for you to download. I will have this presentation posted on the National Indian Health Board's YouTube channel on Monday morning. I will send you a um, email letting you know when it is available on the YouTube channel. For all of those that register, you will get that um, that notification. All participants have been muted. Please leave yourself on mute unless the presenter asks you to unmute and engage. However, you know, I always like those little corners. If you're having trouble hearing at any point, please let the presenters know or let me know via chat. And if you need anything repeated at any time, please do not hesitate to let the presenters know because we do feel like this information is necessary. And I know a lot of tribes are working on their recovery plan. So this is information you may want to have. We encourage you to enter questions into the chat box throughout the webinar. If you have a direct question for me about something that the presenter said, you may um, message me directly and I can give you that, te that technical assistance right here, right now. Once we get to the Q&A portion of the webinar, you can either type your question in the box or you can unmute yourself. Our speakers will love it if you engage with them. They love it if you unmute yourself and ask your questions orally. If you have any technical issues, please do not hesitate to direct it to me, Adriana Marzette, or Courtney Willer at any given time. Now, with all of that being said, let's introduce today's speakers. We have Dr. Jean Jenny Wei. Dr. Wei has been working as an internal medicine physician at Gallup Indian Medical Center since 2012, spending half of her clinical time as a hospitalist and half as a primary care physician. She also chairs the McKinley County Alcohol Task Force. She received her undergraduate medical degree and master of public health at Harvard and completed internal medicine residency and chief residency at the University of California, San Francisco, where she is an assistant clinical professor. She is board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine. And our second presenter is Ms. Superstar Mia Lozado, was raised in Honolulu, Hawaii, and has worked at Gallup Indian Medical Center in New Mexico as a general internalist since August of 2012, she leads the Internal Medicine Department's Quality Performance Improvement Initiatives and spearheads the Re-Emissions Task Force. Mia, Mia started the first short center round site in New Mexico at Gallup Indian Medical Center for Staff Wellbeing. She's board certified in addiction medicine and coordinates the medication assistant treatment prescriber group 
at Gallup Indian Medical Center. She attended the University of Chicago Pittsburgh School of Medicine, <laughs> completed internal medicine residency at UCSF in the primary care, care track at San Francisco General Hospital and spent her chief resident year at San Francisco General Hospital. And she is also an assistant clinical professor at UCSL. So without further ado, I turn it over to our presenters, Mia and Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for that introduction and for the invitation to, to join you all today. We are thrilled to, to share some of our experiences that we've had here running a, a COVID isolation hotel program and would like to share some of the context um, of our setting here out in Gallup, New Mexico. So Jenny and I both trained, as you heard, in internal medicine at UCSF. And after our chief year, we moved out here to work for Gallup Indian Medical Center, GIMC an Indian health service facility here. Um, we started back in 2012. And pre-COVID, we split our time as hospitalists and primary care docs, um, but with a particular focus on addiction medicine and transitions of care. Um, and it was because of these interests that it really drew us toward our work caring for um, this population that has been made vulnerable by structural violence, historical trauma, racism, and so many other factors. And so that really translated into how we got involved in this work in COVID. So we thought it would be important to share a little bit of context about where we work. Um, and first, the lovely required CE slide for you all. Uh, I'm glad folks are getting credit for this. Um, our objectives are, are that we'll first discuss um, some of the unique characteristics of Gallup setting um, and our medical environment here as you know, Indian country is, is vast and the, and the resources and setting really varies um, from site to site. And then we'll talk about a, a novel way to care for um, unsheltered persons, um, particularly those with a history of substance use disorder, a particular interest of ours. And then we'll show how a previously already existing long-standing multi-agency collaboration really helped to facilitate quick um, thinking on our feet um, with an innovative COVID-19 response here in an Indian Health Service location. So this is where we are, Gallup, New Mexico. The red circle is the area where we sit in western, northwestern uh, New, New Mexico. Um, we are technically off the uh, Navajo reservation. Gallup itself um, is a checkerboard area, frequently switching between reservation and non-reservation land throughout even like the city of Gallup. But we're surrounded on, on almost all four sides um, by uh, the Navajo reservation. Um, Gallup itself has about 20,000 residents. Um, on weekends and, and earlier in the month, those, that population really can surge up to 60,000, sometimes 100,000 folks here in town, whether it's for events, shopping um, and getting essentials, um, and then folks returning um, to their homes on the reservation. Uh, the McKinley County is where our Gallup sits, our county, and um, the demographics of our county are, are that they, it's about 80% Native American, 14% um, Latinx, 8% um, white, non-Hispanic, um, and the, the number of those living in poverty is about 32%, just for context um, of our area. Gallup India Medical Center, where we work, is a federal IHS site. Um, it was first opened in 1961, soon after the IHS was founded in 1955. Um, our inpatient facility, which is what you see here, um, was built soon um, around that time in the 1960s and technically has um, 99 beds. Um, and as we've seen, you know, as many places have seen across the country, it's frequently not staffed for that much, um, given the fact that we have nursing shortages and others. Um, we have, you know, upwards of nearly 6,000 admissions per year at our hospital. We have extensive emergency care here. Um, we're a level three trauma um, facility, one of the few, I think last I had checked, either the only or one of few trauma centers um, for IHS facilities. 
Um, and our specialties include basic um, things without many subspecialists. So we have pediatrics, internal medicine, family medicine, surgery, orthopedics, um, given our trauma program, um, emergency medicine, but many of the subspecialties that we were accustomed to as internal medicine providers, we do not have here. So what really drew Jenny and I out here um, for our career was our ability to be both a generalist and a specialist for our patients, since the closest subspecialists um, are up to about 130 miles away in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So that's a bit of our, our setting. So what happened in Gallup? So it, nobody ever wants to be highlighted in the New York Times as being number one of a negative thing like this. So for a long time, the New York Times was putting up these places hardest hit by per capita numbers of cases and deaths. And this, this initial um, slide um, was from the fall of 2020, but it continued with these numbers with Gallup being in the top one, two, and three um, up until the New York Times stopped um, making these categorizations. Um, last I had checked, we were still number three per capita for cases and deaths in the country. Um, our county, you can see in the top right corner, I just looked this one up yesterday, um, is profoundly impacted by COVID. So our number of cases, um, one in three individuals has had COVID in our county, and one in 125 individuals in our county has died from COVID. So when you look at this, Gallup is not necessarily an exception. So in, if we look at the, the COVID deaths um, by race, indigenous populations have suffered tremendously, staggeringly higher um, than, than anywhere, any other group. Rates of COVID deaths in indigenous populations were, are alarmingly higher compared to US all races. And so what does a community or a health system or a healthcare provider as an individual do when they see this happening in front of their eyes? Um, it can be COVID, it can be another disease, it can be something else that we see in the future. So what do we do? We try to tailor our response to, to our specific setting. And that's what we tried to do here. And so this I've, we found to be, uh, Jenny and I, very informative, this um, Social Vulnerability Index, the SVI, that the CDC um, presents and has data for, for every county in the country. And it uses a, a conglomeration of factors, as you can see outlined here, that are, you know, whether it's uh, transportation or socioeconomic status, language, um, and then categorizes based on this score, you know, how vulnerable, we can never fully, you know, capture this number, but to give us an idea, a gestalt of, of how vulnerable population is. Um, and you can see McKinley, the higher um, the number, the worse. And we were one, we're like extremely, extremely vulnerable population. And as has been highlighted throughout the pandemic, um, COVID didn't necessarily make people vulnerable. It highlighted vulnerabilities that already existed prior to COVID. And it just bore them bare um, and then exacerbated them beyond belief. Um, so this was not news to us, but being able to frame it in such a way to, to see, yes, we, we we are we were we were a sitting duck in, in a sense uh, in terms of a community that could struggle tremendously with COVID and that's what we've seen. So all of this is to say that a community or a county or a state needs to be aware of who's being impacted um, by COVID so that they can shape their program specifically around those individuals. Um, and so in our county, in our town, those with a lower socioeconomic status, Native Americans, those who were living in multi-generational homes and those with substance use disorders were the population being hardest hit. So we needed to create programs that tailored that were tailored to them specifically. Otherwise we weren't going to see any mitigation or, or impact at all. Um, so what happened, you know, what created this huge you know, surge in our community? Um, and I think you guys have probably discussed these things before and seen this in your own communities. You know, it was the lack of running water. You know, a third of individuals on in the Navajo Nation do not have access to running water. Um, the, the food desert that is um, the Navajo Nation with only 13 grocery stores in the entire um, expansive area that's, you know, equivalent to West Virginia, um, 27,000 square miles, and with only 13 grocery stores. Um, 
we realized how, you know, these, these um, mandates to shelter in place were really a privilege, privilege, something that I could easily do in my own home, but many folks were not um, able to do that when they needed to, to frequently leave for, for basic essentials and necessities for livestock and other things that they had to seek hours and hours away and had to go to, to other um, areas and travel more. Um, I remember speaking to many family members um, that I was taking care of about the, the idea of staying at home and how the, we need to understand um, who I, I am non-native and I need to understand the, the communities that I'm working with and the individuals in front of me. And when I say it's important to stay home, that my patients were reminding me that the definition of home is, is far more expansive than I had imagined and that auntie's home and grandma's home that that may be 50 yards away those those clusters of homes were all considered one home in many people's minds and so that was potentially feeding into transmission and so how we communicate how we share um, best practices or mitigation um, ideas needs to be within the the cultural context and milieu um, the the struggles with having access to care being hours and hours away for many folks, um, which would then you know um, uh, translate to delays in care for many individuals, um, as we've seen how rapidly you know COVID can progress in in more inflammatory um, conditions of it, um, and I think it goes. Maybe it goes without saying, or but I think it's still important to always say that historical trauma um, that has occurred over and over and intergenerational trauma for, for the populations that, that we're working with continues to lead to this undercurrent of mistrust of, of non-native individuals and of the federal government um, and understandably so. And, and that um, many times will, will um, impact how individual interactions and recommendations may be um, accepted or not um, in, in a given context. And when we've discussed these things before, but we've been reminded um, very gently how important it is to focus on the positive. There's so many things that, that made um, our area um, very vulnerable to COVID, but there were so many things that were done so extremely well with huge successes. And I think focusing on the strong response that our area had um, is so important because reviewing our successes can build strength for future endeavors. So within Gallup and Indian Health Service, we had rapid testing um, uh, here at our facility. We very quickly um, transitioned from send out testing to in-house testing. And from the initial spring of 2020 to now, where we have um, testing results that come back within a couple of hours and can notify patients very rapidly. And so we don't have folks who are waiting two, three, five, seven days for their test results. We will talk specifically about our hotel motel isolation program. Um, that was a, a thinking outside the box, creative way to address isolation for folks who may not have access to isolation um, options otherwise. Um, we were very fortunate to coordinate with a network of hospitals throughout New Mexico to facilitate quick transfers for um, very sick people. Um, and we continue to do now that tests, now that treatments have been made more available, rolling out um, extensive um, and very quick access to treatment um, modalities for individuals, whether that be monoclonal antibody or oral treatments, Paxlovid, things like that is what we've transitioned to more recently, where in real time we get a positive result um, and call a patient back and start them on treatment if eligible um, pretty rapidly. Navajo Nation did an excellent job with lockdowns. Um, and you can see when they, ha they have excellent graphs showing how the lockdown timing really helped to mitigate um, new cases early on in the pandemic. Wide testing, extensive contact tracing. Um, that was a system shared by all of Navajo Nation, even um, different service units, IHS facilities, uh, getting everybody on the same page. Um, and both Navajo Nation and IHS doing wonderful vaccine efforts um, with high rates of, of vaccination for folks, um, not only based in healthcare facilities, but also going out chapter house events and doing home-based um, vaccine efforts and so many things to, to um, try to make um, any potential next surges more manageable. Jenny's going to take over at this point and talk about more details of our Gallup Hotel um, Isolation Program. 
All right, thank you. Yeah, so as Mia mentioned, you know, given our limited resources here in Gallup and, you know, given some of the um, social vulnerabilities that we knew we had, we knew that we needed to plan ahead of time if we were to be hit with COVID uh, to really to really make sure that the impact was as uh, little as possible. Um, I think the other really important thing that is not necessarily mentioned in the social vulnerability index is just an, another important point that I want to make sure to address and is an important story of the of the our initial COVID surge here in Gallup. So, you know, another list that you don't want to be at the top of is the, you know, rates of alcohol related death in the United States. And unfortunately, where we are in New Mexico um, has had the highest rates of alcohol related death of any state in the US since 1997. And you can see, <clears throat> I just want you guys to keep the number in mind of, you know, 27.9 deaths per 100,000 as being the US average. And here in New Mexico, it's 51. Per hundred thousand, um, and unfortunately, this has uh, this um, distinction um, has has continued for decades here in New Mexico. If you actually break it down by county, where we are in McKinley County, uh, you can see that um, McKinley County has the highest death rates among all counties in New Mexico, whereas the average in the U.S. was twenty seven. Um, over here in McKinley County, it's one hundred and sixty six per 100,000, and it's not uh, surprising that the northwest corner of New Mexico is where the Navajo Nation sits. American Indians and Alaska Natives bore the highest burden of alcohol-related death with a death rate of 170 per 100,000. The reason I mention this is because although we already knew some of the social vulnerabilities that people live multi-generationally, people are going to have a tough time isolating and quarantining um, in, in homes where there are upwards of 10, 15, 20 people living in one, in one home unit. Um, we also knew that we had a lot of congregate settings in town. Um, we have congregate shelters in town. And in particular, we have an alcohol detox facility um, called NCI. And NCI is actually an incredible resource that we have here. It's people who are found intoxicated um, on the streets, unable to protect themselves, or do not have a place to stay for the night after they might have come into town um, uh, to drink and um, or don't have a ride back. They are able to stay at the uh, detox facility. And pre-COVID, the detox facility was often holding upwards of 100 some people every night um, just to kind of help to make sure that they were safe, had a safe place to stay, had food, et cetera. And so in addition to all the other social vulnerabilities, we knew that if the detox facility would, would, was gonna get a case um, that there would, it would spread um, like a Petri dish. And um, so we, we knew that we needed to think ahead before, before COVID hit us. So I'll say early in March, you guys recall, our first case here was, in, uh, was on March 18th at, at our hospital. <clears throat> And so even before then, starting, I still remember starting in February and March, our infectious disease doctor and all folks were really warning us, we have to plan ahead. We have to start closing down clinics. We have to think about um, what's gonna happen if we surge. And so, you know, we, um, as mentioned during in the introduction, I uh, am the chair for our McKinley County Alcohol Task Force, where we would meet monthly with all the different organizations in town, the city, the county, the state, nonprofit organizations, um, other um, other programming, and to really make sure that we were working together and not in silos to, to counter the alcohol um, alcohol challenges that we have here in Gallup. So we kind of called a, a, an urgent meeting to, with the group to try to check in and say, hey, um, if there's an outbreak at NCI or if there's an outbreak at the detox facility and, and the other congregate shelters, we really need to have a good plan in place. We started working with all of these multiple local agencies, community groups, volunteers uh, came out to help. And we really started thinking about every possible location space to be able to shelter people during their isolation and quarantine. So we thought about the local gyms, the recreation centers, churches, schools that had closed down. Um, and ultimately one of our volunteers, you know, were, were of course noticing that tourism was down and a lot of the hotels parking lots were completely empty. So a couple of our volunteers literally started calling every single motel in town to see if they would be willing to house some of our, our patients that needed, um, that either were waiting a test um, result for COVID or uh, that tested COVID positive. And I still absolutely feel like these are some of the bravest souls in our whole community, um, those that were working in the hotels, those that were cleaning the hotels, um, and uh, those, those transport drivers to, to drive people to the hotels that were some of our bravest um, 
bravest uh, community members. And, I, and I, it still brings me to tears just to think how willing they were to help our community. So with, um, the, with funding from, the, from um, the state of New Mexico, um, of Department of Health, with federal funding, um, we were able to open the very first um, COVID isolation site in all of the Four Corners region. Um, as you can see, uh, it was, we were able to get that shelter open on March 24th, which was even less than a week from our very first case. So at that time, we really only had a few cases of, of COVID. Um, but even so, we were starting to test a lot of people. And I still remember, this, this was around one of the first or second weekends in March, that Mia got a phone call from one of, from the emergency department saying that there's a patient that typically shelters at NCI, at the detox facility, but that um, he came in with some symptoms of COVID and was, and was awaiting a test. And at that time, unfortunately, it took us quite a few days to get the test results back. And there was no place for him to go. And we started, gosh, we started thinking, maybe we can just put together some money to get him a hotel room. Um, and again, kind of so, all of this was happening in concert to say, we need to have a program in place for, uh, you know, not just relying on us paying out of pocket. You know, we actually did start a, we actually did start a, um, a, a fundraiser. And uh, in the first week or two, we got about $2,000 and we're like, wow, this is amazing. This will get us through the pandemic. Um, you know, of course, to realize we've, I don't actually know exactly how much funding has gone into it, but a lot more than $2,000. So, you know, I've kind of been foreshadowing the unfortunate instance where on April 6th, so just a couple of weeks after that, our Gallup detox facility, uh, we had our index case there. Um, the, one of our clients, um, we call them relatives. Um, one of our relatives was found to be COVID positive. And unfortunately he had spent um, three of the last seven days in detox um, that night. And uh, just because of the facilities, because of the challenges with holding so many people per night, um, had, had such close contact with so many people. Ultimately, we found that he had 140 contacts. Um, and over the course of the following week, we were able to find about 120 of them and 75% tested COVID positive. And um, so, you know, you hear about statistics about congregate settings, nursing homes, and the positivity rates um, when there's an index case there. And you would see 25, 30, 50% but 75% positivity rate was extraordinary. And again, something that we were absolutely horrified of knowing some of the, the, the way that some of our congregate settings are set up. So if over the course of just a week or two, you can, well, I'll show you the graph in a moment, but we had a significant increase in the need for sheltering. So at first we just had one hotel and over the course of the following two weeks, we were able to get three more hotels all in the course of that week. And by, Late April, just a couple weeks later, we had um, surged to uh, four motels with about 140 to 150 patients each night uh, in the hotel program. This is a graph of our positive cases um, for you know for the year 2020, and you can see <clears throat> our first case was right on March 18th, and then right when we had that index case found at uh, the detox center, we had our initial surge. Um, where we gotten up to 60 positive cases per day. We thought that was bad um, until we had, you can see our later surge um, coming on in, uh, in December. And then we thought that was bad. Uh, I don't show you the slide about what happened, what happened with Omicron, where we got up to 200 positive cases per day. Um, but just to kind of give you a sense of where we're at right now. So what is, um, what was, what constituted the hotel program? Well, you know, the main goal of the hotel program was essentially to provide anything that may be needed to ensure that these patients could safely isolate without leaving their rooms. But this is a very special population. This is not just a population that um, has COVID um, that needs to isolate. They also li likely have been drinking recently and could go through alcohol withdrawal. And this was really challenging because no one really feels comfortable having someone isolate in a hotel room by themselves within the first couple of days, possibly going through alcohol withdrawal. And not only that, by definition, not being able to go out anywhere to get alcohol to stave off their withdrawal. So this is a really big component of our program. And again, I think very unique to a lot of isolation programs where most programs that we've heard of across the country did not allow people who suffered from substance use disorders to isolate in the hotels. But we had to be creative. We had to make sure that this was fitting our population and our needs here in our community. So of course we offered um, rooms and uh, hotel rooms as well as three meals a day. We also offered um, transport back and forth to the hospital. Of course, a lot of folks were not able to get 
someone who would be willing to transport them. So um, I'm going to shout out Ben Cruz, who was there from the very beginning, and if you believe it or not, is still with us to this day transporting. Our hotel isolation program has never shut down. We've continued to be able to isolate um, folks in the program, and up until the last time we did some of the counting, um, we've isolated over 2,000 people in our hotel program. We also had an incredible collaboration with, um, the, the, with COPE, which is an acronym for Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment. And they're, um, they're actually the only domestic partners in health site on, and they're located on Navajo Nation. They're an incredible program. Rest in peace, Paul Farmer. Um, and they were incredible early on. They were essentially volunteering to take calls um, from the hotel um, patients 24-7 any issues with um, maybe needing additional snacks, maybe needing additional toiletries, tampons, books, clothing, radio. They even bought a ref refrigerator for a patient so that they could um, be taking their insulin there um, and, uh, and be able to store it in the, in, the, in the hotel. So they were an incredible resource for us. You know, each motel, we kind of joke, um, we're all, of course, trying to get patient-centered medical home uh, designation. And we kind of joke that each motel ended up becoming a patient-centered medical home where we had providers that were able to check in on patients daily. Um, you know, and there was a 24-7 doctor line for any patients that had any acute issues um, and symptoms, et cetera, that we could write some prescriptions and have them delivered to the hotel, nausea medications, um, cough medications, et cetera. We were also help, able to help folks get their chronic refills on their medications as well. So of course we didn't want someone who had diabetes um, not be able to take their insulin for the, for the seven to 10 to 15 day isolation that we had them in. We were also of course specifically concerned about, and, and I think the other important thing about the medical oversight was um, we were able to really get a lot of our providers to, to volunteer to rotate in the hotels. And that was really important to reassure the funders that it was going to be as safe as possible for them to be there. Every day they were checked in on for their for alcohol withdrawal, for example. And we were able to prescribe some folks that needed it, uh, benzodiazepines or other medications to assist their, their symptoms. Also understanding that a large portion of folks do struggle with mental health and substance use disorders, it was really challenging for them to be isolated in a hotel room um, with no access to their, their typical ways to cope. Um, and so it was really important for us to have certified peer support workers. Um, we, we, we collaborated with a CPSW program where every single patient was assigned a CPSW to check in on them every day, make a phone call to check in on them. Um, are, so every day someone would get a check-in from a doctor or provider. Every day they would get a phone call from the certified peer support worker to check in just on any other needs that they had. Um, we also worked really closely with our chaplains, our native medicine providers, our medicine men actually went out foraging for herbs and we would deliver them to patients in their, in their hotel rooms. And this is also just something that brings me to tears is there were a few times where we would, where we would um, provide these medications to patients and just the the incredible gratitude that our, our patients had, you know, that our medicine men cared enough to go forage for them and we to, for, to have us deliver these medications to them. Um, just so important for our patients to know that um, we are working together with and not just instead of or in spite of, um, uh, you know, native medicine healers. So we try to do that in, in all aspects here at, at Gallup India Medical Center. And finally, you know, we, uh, we had a donation of, I think, about 20 iPads. And so we were actually able to get folks set up with um, iPads for, for telemedicine visits. Um, they were able to log into AA meetings, NA meetings, and then and group sessions. And we were also able to connect them with family um, if they were trying to get in touch and, and see if, if, if anything that they could at least see someone on the screen um, to really continue to keep them motivated. So all in all, um, we had over 100 volunteers come and help us. And that's about 50%, about 50% of them were volunteers from our hospital, speech pathologists, physical therapists. We had quite a few doctors come out of retirement to come help round in the hotels to, to do phone calls, to check in on patients. Um, and as I mentioned, over 2000 people spent at least one night in our hotel here. 93% were Navajo. Um, the the rest probably 5% Zuni, and then the rest were some of the other Pueblo tribes that we care for. But they really come from all over, they came from all over the reservation, um, which kind of, I think, um, speaks to what Mia was talking about, how Gallup is the border town that has the Walmart, that has the post office, um, that has the hospital. So a lot of people are coming 
are coming to Gallup and then kind of going back out onto the reservation, um, which is again, um, one of the ways that possibly COVID was spread so quickly here um, is that people would perhaps be in detox, spread back to the reservation, come back to detox or come back to the, come back to Gallup. So it was, um, it was a real challenge. And I think one of the main reasons why we had the surge in the first place. This is just a picture of me that Mia took, you know, so um, we were able to, for the first few months, we were able to use uh, federal funding to actually not just isolate people for their active COVID infectious state, but we were able to isolate people. Uh, we were able to help quarantine as well to help them shelter in place. So there were some folks that um, were experiencing homelessness chronically and were able to actually stay in our hotel rooms for three, three, four months um, until some of the funding changed and we had to kind of think more creatively about what to do then, which I'll talk about. But you could see, I mean, we started, they, they, were, they were our buddies, you know, they would, um, they would do incredible artwork um, like uh, displayed here. And so many of them would just express all, so much gratitude for all the providers that would check in on them. So I think, you know, um, it, it, I'm just absolutely moved by how our community was able to come together, you know, to see some of the needs that we had and, and to, um, to get all of our resources together to really help this vulnerable population. And I have no doubt that we were able to, you know, address people's acute issues with COVID. We were able to get people to the hospital um, more urgently. We were able to, you know, uh, they were they were close to the hospital so we could get them there if needed. Um, and I really feel like we were able to flatten the curve with um, isolating people. But one of the other incredible things that came out of this um, program was seeing that housing first works. The idea that when you actually provide people with their basic necessities, like housing and food um, and toiletries, um, and they were actually able to start to address some of their, have their basic needs met so that they can start to work towards longer term goals, like getting a job, like getting treatment for their substance use disorder, um, like getting an ID. Finally, we were actually able to contact them. They had a phone so we could get them an ID to get them uh, to uh, be able to apply for insurance, to get them to be able to apply for housing and, and job applications. So over the course of those first four months that we were able to house people for that long, people even stayed uh, engaged enough to, to transfer to um, nursing homes. We were, uh, sorry, uh, rehab facilities. <laughs> um, we were actually able to get over 50 people into rehab programs um, for their substance use across New Mexico and Arizona. And, um, and while in the hotel program, and we actually have a um, someone from uh, the Brigham Infectious Disease Program looking at some of our statistics here, but we were able to show that these patients had significantly decreased emergency department visits, significantly decreased run-ins with the law, decreased time spent in detox, decreased time spent in jail. And, and so it showed us that housing first is not only the right thing to do, but it is cost effective to be able to provide um, folks with stable housing so that we could start to really work on some of, the, some of their other goals. Because of this, um, we were able to get creative with um, advocating for creative with funding to advocate for permanent and uh, emergency housing and permanent supportive housing and transi transitional housing. So as we started to lose funding for specifically um, being able to keep people in the hotels, we were able to apply for other funding to, to get a, what we call a wellness hotel open. And we were able to house over 50 people for over the course of the three months that the wellness hotel was open until we then transitioned them to um, a permanent supportive housing option that opened up in town called the Lexington Hotel. And so that opened up at the beginning of last year and has been housing folks throughout this whole time. Um, they of course continue to work with our case managers and social workers to try to get them into more permanent housing options as well. The other amazing thing that came out of COVID is that we, we saw that our detox facility was, was, was important, but not sufficient to be able to um, provide treatment options for, our, for, our, for those experiencing um, struggling with substance use disorder. So we were actually able to open up another detox facility, a new sobering center, which actually was mo more focused on medical detox and was able to provide uh, and link people to rehab and to um, long-term transitional um, uh, transitioning, uh, care transition to um, continue to for long-term sobriety. So, you know, I think so many communities have been hit 
by COVID. Um, and it's, you know, just thinking back to those times in 2020, where we were getting all of this set up, it, it, it just continues to, um, to touch me how, how much it's affected our community. Um, but seeing some of the positive impact, um, I think just represents um, the resiliency of our community, the resiliency of our, of our people. And um, I'm really proud of that. This is actually a picture of a picture that one of our patients um, drew for us. Um, and it says, which means thank you in Navajo. And he drew this for one of our volunteers who came from San Francisco um, to, to volunteer to, to rotate at the hotels. And so this, let me just read this last um, quote here. Um, this was actually a letter that one of our patients wrote to us. Um, and I'm just having trouble seeing the top here, hold on. So I think it says, dear healthcare providers, um, thank you, you know, sorry, I can't see the top here. Um, but thank you and your first responders. They are doing a great job checking our temperature and any other medical conditions we have. I've been put in this motel room by myself. At first, I thought it was okay. And then I wanted to leave because I have an addiction problem. And some of your first responders have helped me by talking to me, setting me up with a treatment center, or I should say a healing center to get rid of my addiction. I'm healing from this poison and, and other poisons. I just would like to say thank you. And so this is just a, you know, a list. I don't even think it's comprehensive, but a list of all of the incredible partners that we had in this collaboration. Um, the Indian Health Service, our Gallup Indian Medical Center, which includes so many, every single department um, volunteered to help us. Um, I mentioned community outreach patient empowerment, um, Navajo Nation and the community health representatives would check in on folks as well. The, our, the other hospital in town, uh, RMCH, also had doctors rounding with us. Of course, our detox facilities, dozens and dozens of volunteers um, honestly, sometimes donating over, you know, two months of their time um, away, away from their families to help our families. Um, and then a, a lot of folks from the city, the county, and the state um, to help us. And I think this looks like a very intimidating list. But um, the, the important thing is behind each of these names is just one person, you know, just one person that was linked to us, whether it was linked to us with our task force, or linked to us just from other community um, uh, events and collaborations in the past. And it just took one person from, from the detox facility and one person from the private hospital in town to link up at our meetings and to really um, collaborate to, to make this as successful as possible. So like I say, we're still running. I think this morning we had about seven patients isolating in the program there. So we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we're still here. We're still here doing the work. Um, but Thank you again so much for um, the opportunity to to speak to you guys, and would love to hear would love to hear um, other experience, similar experiences you guys have had in, in isolating, um, or just any other questions that you have. So, Dr. Wei, we do uh, we are now going into Q and A. We do have two questions now in the chat box, and then as you answer these, I'm sure more will come in. So, the first one reads: How was IQ enforced and improvement, quality improvement enforced, or was it voluntary? Was there a role for law enforcement in the hotel program? I think that's a great question about how, so um, the, the program was entirely voluntary. So um, folks were allowed to leave at any time with the understanding that then they would be leaving the program. So they were not forced to stay. Um, we debated this a lot. And I think a lot of places had this challenge early on in the pandemic about what do you do when there is a actively contagious, infectious, COVID positive individual who does not want to isolate. And we were equivalent, <laughs> we were, um, comparing that to, you know, when, when an individual has active tuberculosis and how there are capabilities to put a public health order by a judge for that individual to, to legally isolate them, it, it became very clear very quickly that the numbers for COVID were going to be far higher than that. And, and our overall kind of ethical ethos for how we wanted to approach this was not um, 
a mandatory um, slant by any stretch, um, we wouldn't even be able to logistically enforce that anyway, but we, we chose to not do that. Um, and so it was entirely voluntary. So it, while folks were participating in the program, they, they did have to stay in their rooms. Um, but if for some reason they found that they had two more days of isolation, but there was an option for them to isolate at home um, because other people were found to be positive or they were able to do some room shifting in the home, folks could leave um, at any point that there was um, nothing forced. That being said, and we, we did think about this and we did have a possible um, situation where if it seemed like somebody was voluntarily and knowingly um, mm -hmm. infecting others and putting others at risk um, and, and understood those consequences, we were able to get a court order for them to, to isolate and, and mm -hmm. um, you know, we had security, but of course security can only um, can only do so much, we would have to call the police to come in. And so there were definitely a few times where patients uh, where patients left the hotel and we weren't necessarily sure they had a safe place to go. And sure enough, they ended up back in, in detox the next day or something. Um, but uh, we never had to use, we never had to use the, the court order. Um, and, and honestly, it probably would have taken longer for us to get the court order and actually enforce it and then find the patient again um, than to, yeah. And I think we were also very cautious, like Mia was saying with, not wanting to, you know, I would call patients all the time and you tell them that they were positive and they'd be like, oh, I'm at Walmart, you know, um, and then, you know, check in on them the next day and they're like, oh, I'm at the laundromat. So, you know, it was hard to like say that we would force someone and in, in for, you know, just because they might be using the hotel program to force them, um, you know, with law enforcement, whereas, you know, a lot of other people that we were calling, uh, unfortunately, weren't quite following and adhering to all those regulations. Yeah, it felt like blatant discrimination of a population that happened to be unhoused. Why would you treat that population differently with legal requirements as opposed to patients who are housed and who might be making similar decisions about not choosing isolation as strictly? So we, we approach it in a much more broad liberal sense. Next question is, what was the role of the New Mexico National Guard? Yeah, and for our specific program, they were actually, um, there were physician assistants. I think we had uh, a Medics. couple, we had uh, EMTs mm -hmm. and they would help us round in the hotel. So they would check vitals, they would check for withdrawal um, and uh, they would you know, kind of help prescribe medications if needed. They also had a large role in general um, in Gallup, you know, just kind of helping out with, um, uh, making sure people are coming in with masks, you know, to the grocery store and in the post office and things like that. So, um, and uh, yeah, we can, Michaela, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question and we'll get to some of these other questions in the chat next. Um, hello, um, this is a question, um, particularly, this is just a comment. I actually was able to work with COPE as a contact tracer during the time of 2020. Nice. And I just wanted to commend you both for um for a great uh program um I was based out in Arizona and it was um I've never seen anything like it and then it you know after I believe maybe you guys may have, um motivated a lot of other communities to do something similar and I think just wanted to add that comment <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Michaela, and thank you so much for coming out here. COPE was a truly and continues to be an incredible resource for us. Um, they continue to do contact tracing. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for your work. So the next comment, um, not really a question, but would it, wouldn't it be nice if we could adapt your model to provide comprehensive primary care, family, preventative, behavioral health, and medicine to our Native communities? Absolutely. I think it, I mean, we've been here for coming on 10 years now, and I, I think it's, it's so clear that models of care need to change and adapt, kind of like how this adapted, like, I think this is what you're saying, to, um, to how people feel most comfortable receiving care and where they need it at the time. Um, and so I, I, I remember back my last day of my residency training, um, I, we had a rotation on a, it was called the homeless van where the, this van in San Francisco would go around and provide um, basic medical care to individuals um, in encampments and in different areas of the San Francisco region. And I remember in my first year of training, 
um, setting up a whole bunch of patients to, to see me in the clinic um, and nobody ever showed up. And on my last day of residency of training, I was seeing some of those folks again, three years later and realizing that this was their care. And, and it was my kind of warped sense of, of how we define care um, in a dedicated clinic hospital setting that, that is not necessarily approachable or possible for many individuals. And so we do need to change how that looks. And if it's bringing care to the chapter houses, to the individuals, collaborating more with the extensive and wonderful CHR, community health representative program, um, that may be the way that we can strengthen our public health network um, so that we are not as vulnerable again. Next question, what do you think was the incentive to the motels? I definitely think early on there, you know, I'm gonna be as positive as possible. I think there, there probably was an, a financial incentive. You know, they really weren't having a lot of tourism. And so a lot of hotel rooms were going unused. Um, that being said, you know, the Howard Johnson has been with us for over a year. They were they were one of the later hotels to come on. So but they've been with, with us for almost two years now and their management team and their the team that that cooks food for them, the team that um, their their um, security guards, they are all invested. Uh, they're all invested in this program and they've gotten honestly a lot of they've gotten some negative negative press you know for someone else checking into the hotel on a completely opposite side of where the where the isolation patients stay um and you know have gotten press about how um they no one should stay at that hotel ever again you know and and um yet they continue to work with us and i think they really believe in the the model and the care that we're providing so they're definitely a part of the team and i think aside from financial incentives um we were able to do a smaller, like, oh, sorry. sustainable beyond, do you think... and I think it's been, I mean, I think the, the question of, do you think this model could be sustainable beyond the COVID pandemic? And I think the many different programs have started to utilize different, different social agencies in town have started to utilize the, the short term to medium term hotel housing kind of shelter option for individuals um, at some of the same hotels that we were utilizing um, for various populations. Um, and, and I think that's, there was a trust that was built already with the, the hotel management. They saw that it went well. They can figure out, you know, longer term contracts that benefit both sides. Um, so I think surprisingly, it, it has translated into some more longer term options for folks. I think the challenge is right now is, yeah, and you know, the wellness hotel, we were able to use funding essentially to kind of create that mm -hmm. beyond and they weren't they weren't folks that were COVID positive, they were just folks that were quote high risk for getting COVID, um, because they had like one medical issue that was the criteria, uh, and we were able to house them through last winter during that um, surge last winter. And, um, and yeah, we were kind of doing a similar model where we were checking in on folks, um, making sure that they were linking to care. So I think it is a sustainable model. The, I think the, the challenge right now is that um, there is a lot of funding available. You know, we used a lot of COVID care funds initially, and now there's the American Rescue Plan funding. And I think people, as I think everybody on this on this call, I would imagine, is just really exhausted. Um, there is a lot of funding out there, and if people are willing to apply for the funds, um, for there's actually money out there to completely renovate a hotel. I think a hotel is probably maybe the easiest, the easier way to go, but you can really renovate any building, but yeah, a hotel with so many individual rooms where you could house folks on um, like a single, single room occupancy type model. Um, and it's just a matter of, again, continuing the collaboration with the city and the county to have the funds to be able to have a nonprofit organization in your, in your town to, um, to essentially do the operational part of the program. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's never ending. Uh, it, it feels like this really just needs to be the beginning of, of our work here. And it sounds like you you all were able to do something in San Juan County, Utah as well, which is fantastic. That, that's just so exciting. I think there was so much innovation happening across the country. Um, so that's awesome that you guys did something similar. <laughs> And we heard about a lot of great programs. Mm -hmm. New York was doing, you know, San Francisco, Air, Bay Area. So many places started to pay people to stay in hotels. I don't know if you saw that paying people to incentivize folks to isolate. So not use like using positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement of law enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, so you would get paid per day that you would stay to isolate. We never did that, but I know that there were programs doing things like that. 
Thanks guys so much for the supportive comments. Um, can you send us some of the funding you're aware of? We, you know, I'm, we are not experts in, in, in homeless care. Um, I think we've, because of the, the nature of the work with COVID, we've become a little bit more accustomed to it. Um, but we have a New Mexico coalition to end homelessness. Um, we also partner with a nonprofit um, heading home, which their main focus is, you know, getting funding for, for, um, uh, for projects like this. So I don't know where, where you're at, but if there is a, like a, like a, a statewide um, group that focuses on the particular state funding that you guys got in the American Rescue Plan. Um, it all depends on whether you're in a small city that needs to get funding distributed from the state versus if you're a bigger county, like for us, Albuquerque and Santa Fe got their own separate funding, for example. So it's a little bit complicated and it's kind of based on where you're located. But um, I think working closely with um, your, your sort of coalition and homelessness or uh, another, another group, they should know some of those resources. Um, and then it, they would be distributed to the city or city or the county to then. Um, and my last comment will be that, I mean, Jenny did an incredible job of cold calling tons of places. She, she is curious and persistent and relentless. And I think it's, Many times it takes a person. Um, she, I, I, she is. I'm no. not nodding about her compliment to me. I'm nodding about some of the comments that are like, we did this. Um, but, but truly, I think sometimes it takes just a, an inquisitive, motivated person to 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 lean on the the institutions and individuals who have that that source of knowledge, the those you know homelessness coalitions and things in the area, and to say, hey, can we set up a meeting so I can pick your brain about something? And then, hey, is it okay if I include you in a meeting with somebody else and and making those connections and picking up the phone and cold calling i think for me as a, a tremendous introvert that is <laughs> absolutely terrifying um but watching her do this to to build collaborations connections between people um uh, i think really was what spurred um this to start and it continues to be the the glue that pushes things forward as individuals respect and care about one another and to collaborate together on seemingly insurmountable problems absolutely uh, northern new mexico pueblo utilized mm -hmm. buffalo thunder yeah, absolutely they were a, a great resource mm -hmm. for us eastern band of cherokee indians did a, a hotel isolation quarantine as well um, and then Rebecca, that's so exciting to hear that Albuquerque is turning the old Loveless Hospital Ooh, into a homeless shelter. I wonder if they're using their American Rescue Plan funding, which they were, um, which they were uh, allocated. So that's awesome. That's great. NPR, great. <laughs> nice. Awesome. So do we have any more questions for Mia and Jenny? If not, you know it's that time of the webinar. We would like for you to use those reactions and that show our presenters some love. I saw Dr. Wei try to ease away and say, I've been smiling for that. Mm -mm. We show love <laughs> around here. So we're not able to give you a standing applause, but we do use our reactions and we do say thank you. We absolutely adore both of you. And Mia, while you're giving Jenny the praises, I also want to recognize you because it takes a lot of work to do what you do. And you are a part of that team and a part of that network. And I'm pretty sure when Dr. Way has reached that point, it's good to have a friend, it's good to have a colleague that you can lean on to help you to just to lift you up when you do get tired, when you do get weak. So this is an excellent example of collaboration in-house and externally. So absolutely, thank you for what you both have done during COVID. Thank you for what you do for our tribal communities. And you are heroes. And we do thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And as you can see, you got all of this praise because this is what we do, honey. <laughs> You guys are awesome. Thank you, you so much. You guys are great. Thank you for the excellent questions and, and facilitation. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. And again, just a quick reminder, this presentation and the slides will be sent to all registrants. 
Also, to receive continued education for this webinar, you must complete the evaluation. And then also, if you want to give some additional praise, or if you were one of those um, attendees that mentioned that you was able to use their model, please reach out to NIHB. We would love to do a success story. Following this call, we will be highlighting this work in our newsletter, and we want to highlight other communities as well. So if your community also was able to like get up a shelter in place doing COVID, please reach out and let us know. Um, again, thank you, thank you, thank you. That concludes the webinar. You all have a blessed day. I, some places it's raining, but you can still drink your water. Get up from your desk, move around, smile, laugh, and have an awesome day. Thank you, thank you.